I was wondering how many of you would still be sitting in the pews by the time I got to the sermon. <laughs> Didn't lose too many. That's good. The liturgy this morning offers a taste of Unitarianism 122 years ago. When Samuel Atkins Elliott visited Salt Lake from his Denver pulpit to inspire religious liberals to form a congregation in this valley, today, February 24th, marks the exact anniversary of this church, which we're celebrating by assaulting your progressive sensibilities. <laughs> the music this morning and the call to worship typified the style of Unitarian worship at that time in the Northeast. This church never experienced such liturgy, and neither did any of the churches in the West. When this congregation signed its charter as a new congregation, putting its liberal stake in the ground, Unitarianism was polarized between radical individualistic humanists and the traditionalists who preferred and pursued Christian worship. Now this morning we got a fair sampling of the traditional Unitarianism of that era. Perhaps it makes us appreciate a little more our church and our contributions to the liberal movement over the past 122 years. We were considered not only a liberal oasis in the conservative landscape of Utah, but also in comparison to our own Unitarian denomination. Samuel Atkins Elliott was the right man to plant the Unitarian seeds in the desert soil of Utah. When he introduced liberal religion to Salt Lake City back in December 1890, Elliot was a mere 28 years old. He had graduated Harvard Divinity School just the year prior. He proved such a gifted speaker that the American Unitarian Association interrupted his studies for the ministry and sent him to the Seattle area to, in their words, evangelize. He then finished his degree in 1889, entered the Unitarian ministry in Denver, where he stayed until 1892, before assuming the ministry in Brooklyn, New York. It's hard to conceive that such a typical Boston Brahmin like Samuel Atkins Elliott could ever feel comfortable in a place like Brooklyn. His grandfather and namesake served as mayor of Boston from 1836 to 1850. And his father, Charles William Elliott, served as president of Harvard College. But there must have been a progressive streak in Samuel Atkins Elliott because he scandalized people in whichever neighborhood he lived. He had the shocking audacity to push the baby carriage in public alongside his wife. And he dared play outdoors with his children. He seemed to create the mold for the modern father. And he had a lot of practice that he and his wife had seven children. In 1898, Elliot became secretary to the American Unitarian Association and in 1900 assumed the presidency where he stayed for the next 27 years. He was the right man for the job, straddling both powerful religious sensibilities at the time, New England traditionalism and Western progressivism. We gain a hint of his leadership skills and oratory from his 1902 presidential address. He announced changing the objectives of the association, located on Beacon Street in Boston, to where they would no longer serve as merely administrators executing the bureaucratic chores of running the AUA. Instead, under his leadership, 
the association will become fully committed to following the prophetic voice. Eliot said he aimed to, and I quote from Eliot, he aimed to seize large opportunities for service by endeavoring to lead the association to the mount of vision from which man may see God and his righteousness and become aware of the fact that they are fellow workers with the Most High. The inner spirit of Unitarianism, Eliot maintained, represents your effort to solve problems of the common good, to lead men out of isolated, self-centered interests into the brave, self-effacing service of the modern world. During his presidency, Eliot created the Department of Social Justice at the American Unitarian Association and founded the Star King School for Ministry in Berkeley in order to offer Western and progressive Unitarians a place to cultivate new leadership. We just lost the spirit of 1891 for a second. <laughs> 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 Eliot proved a master, I believe, in walking the tightrope between Christian worship and liberal progressivism. He defined the Unitarian theological position at the time as lyrical theism. How's that for brilliance? Lyrical takes the stodginess out of traditional worship while expanding concepts of what theism might actually mean and how it can be used within a rational religion. I also figure that if you want to abbreviate your next conversation when someone asks you about your beliefs, just tell them you are a lyrical theist <laughs> and watch them walk away real fast. <laughs> when pushed to define lyrical theism, Eliot referred to it as an ordered universe governed by a benign deity who acted through nature, law, and spirit upon the souls of men and who responded to prayer and good works with a hastened sense of cosmic realization. You gotta admire a man who thinks and speaks cosmically in the early 1900s. But cosmic accurately portrays his theology when he proclaims a partnership between humankind and whatever supernatural spirit there may be to solve the problems of the common good. In his inimitable style and lyrical way, he described the Unitarian Church as the best tool for building the kingdom of God. Wow. We may want to take a deep breath after hearing of Unitarianism's unflinching embrace of archaic religious language, but we may also want to reassess the startling claim by the founder of this church and president of the association that Unitarian churches provide the best tool for building the kingdom of God. You know, I think we might still share that perspective today, 122 years after the founding of this church. Basically, two interpretations of the kingdom of God exist. The first one fosters this, this wave of piety and fear, where the kingdom is parked in another realm and holds sway over us through judging our behavior. But the kingdom of God, has also been interpreted as a commitment to social justice where we work to transform the earth into a heavenly paradise where peace and justice prevail. The kingdom of God offers a rich metaphor for that which must be our mission, creating a heaven on earth. 
Jesus preached the kingdom of God as an entity to be established on earth through healing, acceptance, and hospitality. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're talking about the fulfillment on earth of God's will. God, let's be lyrical. Goodness, love, morals, value, equality, principles, holiness, sacred worth, that which motivates us to make the world more perfect. As in our reading of Psalms this morning, give justice to the weak, maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute, rescue the weak and needy, and deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Isn't that the issue still before us today, but we call it the sequester? where budget cuts to the afflicted and destitute will only expose how vile we humans can be. It can only delay the kingdom. Understood politically, the kingdom is a political entity. Delay the kingdom from gracing this world. 